filbers a lot, especially when I'm doing blocking stuff because I'm pushing around the paint quite a bit. I really like to use, uh, and especially when I'm working with heavy body paints, I like to use the filber. So basically what I have is some gray here. So now I already went in with the highlights first. So now I'm going to go in with these darker tones and put in some of these darker tones in the cheek and the eye sockets of this fella that's already kind of been shot with arrows here. And he's already, he's already deceased and uh, on the ground. And you can see the arrows in his chest there. But, uh, and I'm not going to have him looking so obvious, but at the same time, I do want to get him in there. I want to get this more paint. I don't want it to be so gestural. I want it to be just a little bit. Uh, uh, this is not going to be the top, the final coat. This is not going to be the final layer. However, um, there's going to be layers that go on top of this. But it's, I still like to paint my under layers. You know, I like to paint those. I don't want those under layers to be um, just to be, I don't like, in this case, since I'm kind of building this painting, this painting doesn't exist. None of these images exist anywhere <laughs> except for was in my head. Now, did I use reference materials to get ideas from these? Yes. But a lot of these were drawings at first. So, and what I have a tendency to do when I'm designing a new concept like this, especially if it's telling a story, and it's of imagery that does not exist, what I have a tendency to do is, um, is uh, to, uh, what I have a tendency to do is, uh, Paint, I want to paint the guy first. Then after I paint the guy, I'm going to build him into the environment. So, but I want to get the guy's face right. I want to get the lighting on him right. So I could just say, okay, I'm going to have him obscured by some grass and I'm going to have this. And I could just have a picture that I made. And then I only paint around. And then that's kind of gets into painting by numbers. And I don't want to do that. And it just, it doesn't look right, it doesn't look as uh, natural, the whole painting doesn't harmonize as one. Sometimes it takes away from the story because it doesn't look as believable, uh, you know, in terms of this, does this image go with that or is this just inserted in or, you know, you kind of get in like a Photoshop kind of mentality, you know, or, you know, a paint by numbers kind of, kind of um, looking painting and I don't want that. I want a painting that actually looks like you know, a painting. I want all I want all the elements to work together in harmony. And in order to do that, I find it's better to just um, to build the elements. In other words, if there's a guy who got shot with arrows, what I'm going to do is just simply paint a guy first, lay it on the ground. And if he fell in a patch of grass, then later I'm going to paint the patch of grass that he fell in that's in the foreground in front of him on top of that. And to me, what I get out of that is I get a better, I wind up getting a better uh, end result when I do that. Um, because the image turns out looking more believable. And oftentimes there's some discovery that you get into when you go to build it that way. And also you build in some impasto into your painting. You're building some impasto. So now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some more black on my palette because this area right here is just the foundation color. It's going to be black, but I'm going to have some green grassy stuff on top of it. So a lot of people say, I like to mix my blacks. Well, you don't have to mix blacks, you know. You could just use exactly, you know, um, you can use the color that you have. So, uh, At one point, uh, I didn't have enough brushes. Now I have so many brushes, I don't even know what to do. Now, uh, you know, you order some brushes, then you okay. I got a bunch of brushes now. Do I need this many brushes? 
And, uh, and then it gets harder to pick your brushes because you just have so many choices where, uh, you know, you might have a couple of dozen brushes and now you have many brushes. And, but it's nice to be able to have brushes, same brushes in different styles so you can load those brushes with different colors, you know. And um, for example, I do want to cover a very large area, with basically black. And I'm, it's not going to be black. I'm going to have some ultramarine blue and some Daxodon purple mixed in. But essentially, it's going to be black. <laughs> and I don't want to use all my ultramarine blue, Daxodon purple. They could be kind of expensive. Whereas this Mars black is not very expensive. And basically, this is going to be an under paint anyway. It's not going to be the top paint. But what I want is some richer black. Because basically, I kind of, um, when I first painted this, I was just kind of laying it out. My dark color that I used there, my black color, was kind of thin. And what I'm doing now is I'm going in mostly with, you know, I have uh, a little bit of medium mixed in this, but it's, I'm trying to keep this really, really mostly with uh, pigment. Because I, but I'm not painting it so thick to make any impasto necessarily. Because the impasto layer is going to be the grass that goes over top of this. So that's kind of like a surprise that I was, I was kind of keeping. But I guess I blew the surprise. Now I told you that I'm going to put grass over there. So when I use a big brush like this, this is a number uh, 12 filber bristle. It does take up a lot of my medium out of my little wells very, very quickly. But when I use too much medium also, it thins out my the opaqueness of my paint too much. And uh, I don't want my paint to be so opaque. I want my paint to be, uh, I want, don't want my paint to be uh, wispy. I don't want it to be thin. I really want a nice, even but you know smooth flat with no real brush strokes in it black color and again i got a little bit of ultramarine blue and a little bit of doxanon purple mixed in here i even have a little bit to tell you the truth it's not totally white I, black i have some oh, some uh, some uh titanium white in there as well <laughs> just so it won't look you know Mars black straight out the tube. That's what I don't want it to look like. I don't, I do want it to radiate with a color. So right now it's radiating more with, if, if, you know, from my point of view as an artist, I can see the dachshund on the purple. I can see the ultramarine blue. I can see more purple in it than anything else. I do not see Mars black straight out the tube. And that's basically what I'm after. I'm just using the Mars black to get it dark. And then what I'm doing is I'm dipping that into Doxanine Purple, actually even in a little bit of Elizabeth and Crimson. And actually, in addition to that, <laughs> even some titanium white. Just to give it something that is not just going to be just black. So, and at first I kind of had that because I kind of had a gesture of some grass that I wanted to put there. Now, I could leave that because the grass is going to get really thick right in this area right here. So I don't really have to have, I really don't have to have any paint there. However, um, at the same time, I do want some paint there. I do want some darks behind that. And it won't hurt anything for me to cover over the gesso layer as much as I can to achieve uh, a ground, you know, by which I can paint on this oil you know, an oil paint, as opposed to the gesso is acrylic. That, that layer is mostly acrylic. So I would just rather just go ahead and just paint this whole thing. And that's what I'm, I decided to do just then, then, is paint this whole thing black, you know, so that I can just, when I paint the subsequent other details, instead of me painting on a white gesso, you know, where it's mostly white, I'm painting on a nice little, not necessarily really thin, but a nice, somewhat thin coat of black. But it's not thin that it's not opaque, because it is opaque. It's nice and opaque, but it's not going to have a whole bunch of, 
and pasta in it. It's not going to have a bunch of brush strokes in it. Because the brush strokes is going to come when I do some other painting of the grass that I'm going to have in this, this layer here. So I'm going to paint this last little bit in here over here. And I think I'm going to need some more black here. Get that in. So, and I, I think I like this because uh, at first I kind of had a gesture and it was kind of looking interesting because that is what I'm going to do with the, with the uh, grass. But for this little moment in time right here in the painting process, I have to take some of that interest of that wispiness out and just have this as black where this hat is until this coat dries. And probably by tomorrow, I'm going to go in and start painting in, you know, I'm going to start painting in that, uh, that grass because this black should set up in 24 hours, especially with the amount of medium that I'm using to pigment ratio. Uh, and especially that my studio is hot now, you know, my studio is going to stay around 75 degrees uh, and it's going to average somewhere around 78 degrees uh, because that's kind of what it's almost like now. Get close to 78 degrees and here. it might be still 77, but still anywhere between 75 and 77. Uh, it's going to cause this to dry in less than 24 hours, you know, 16 hours, 12 hours, something like that. With this particular, because I have about 30% linseed oil, 30% uh, uh, galket, and 10% uh, galket, I mean 20% galket, I mean, I'm sorry, 30% galket, 20% linseed oil, and... Um, 50% gam salt. Of course, I like gambling paints because it's very professional paint. The pigments are very dense. You know, it's not like the student grade paint or the cheap paints you get from like Michaels or somewhere like that. I mean, I mean, you can get good paint. You can get Winsor Newton paints, some really good paints, you know, from Michaels. But uh, you can also get some very cheap amateur paint from Michael's too. But in every art store, they're going to carry the student grade, and they're also going to carry the uh, professional grade paints. And uh, I always paint with professional grade paints. I almost never paint with student grade paints. I might use a student grade paint as an undercoat, you know, for blocking something out. But I would very rarely use it to paint the whole painting with. Okay, then likewise here, I have some blocked out things where you can actually, <laughs> some of this paint is thin, but you can still see the brush strokes. So what I'm gonna do also on this is I'm gonna just, um, I kind of have this as, you know, I, I, I'm able to paint on top of paint. That's very good. But I want the paint to be smooth when I come in with the texture for the clothing that's going to go on to this guy. So I'm going to just paint this a little bit better before I get to that level of painting on this particular element here. So I kind of switched the conversation away from the historical part because, again, I don't want to offend anybody with too much heavy duty. You know, the Native Americans were jacked up and the colonials did a bad job. I don't want to do too much of that because I don't want to be abusive to anyone too much, but at the same time, I want to tell the truth. And I want to make sure I tell it from the Native American's point of view. And it doesn't go all the time with some people's concepts, you know, and with, or what some people want to hear, <laughs> you know. But um, again, I feel like it's my job to tell it the truthful way and the honest way and not just and just risk the fact that some people might get a little upset um, because they live in an alternate universe and they want things to be the way it is in the alternate universe. And I like to not be in the alternate universe. I like to be <laughs> in reality as much as I can. And I like to tell things from the reality way, you know, from the way, from, from my best information that I can get. I mean, I do that in my painting. I try to paint to my best abilities, 
using the best technique that I think is available to make this particular painting, to give the painting the, the outlook that I want, you know, attitude that I want, you know. Okay, so now I have this kind of um, blacked in quite nicely. And so now that I have this, I'm gonna focus, go back into the face some more. And I'm gonna focus on that. And the face, uh, with the face, I'm gonna get more into, I'm still gonna stick with this. I'm running out of medium, so at least, uh, yeah, I'm running out of medium, so let me go and refresh my medium. And I'm gonna sort through my brushes a little bit better. I do have some brush management technologies working here. Have a certain way of working with them, and uh, so let me do those things. And of course, when you have new brushes, you're trying to work those into your workflow, and you got your old standby brushes. Some of them good, some of them you just make them work, <laughs> you know. But you're used to working with them. It can be a little bit of a different way of sorting through my my brushes, you know. Um, however, I do like the brushes that I have. Now, did I buy the absolute most expensive brushes you can buy? Some of them are. A few of them. And some of them are some pretty good quality brushes, but they're not the most expensive. And then some of them are very good brushes, but very, very affordable, very inexpensive. So um, what I do in terms of brushes, what I have a tendency to do is... Um, <clears throat> is uh, experiment. You know, I like Winsor Newton brushes. I think they make some of the best, not the, the best, but they make a very solid brush, all of their brushes. I have their sables, I have the bristles. They make a very, I mean, on a scale of one to 10, they're about an eight, you know? You know, and that's good enough. I mean, I could paint some really good stuff with paint, paint brushes on an eight now. Have I found cheaper brushes that's off the wall made in China brushes? Of course, Winston Newton's is made in England. Have I found some made in China brushes that do just as good of a job? Yes. I made some made in India brushes that do a pretty good job? Yes. Have I found some made in China, made in India brushes that suck? Yes, a lot of them. <laughs> you know, the hairs come out, in the paint, I just hate that. I hate getting hairs in my paint. Because first of all, I pay a lot of money for the painting. Then I stretch it, I put a lot of work into it. And then I organize it and I put the paint on a certain way and I feel like every time I put a brush stroke on, there's magic going on, there's something special happening. And of course, what I don't want when that special thing is happening, I don't want a piece of hair from the brush jacking it up. <laughs> I don't want that. So that is what happens when you are using cheap brushes. So I do not recommend painting with cheap brushes. I recommend painting with good brushes and if you can get them. But you can find some very inexpensive made in China brushes even that are very good. I mean, a, a hog's hair is a hog's hair, a weasel hair for sable, his sable is a weasel. Bristle is a hog. <laughs> I mean, it's a natural fiber. Now, when it comes to synthetic brushes, that's a whole different shopping level, you know, so I can get into brushes a little bit. That's a whole different shopping thing because some people's technology that goes into making sable, I mean, synthetic bristles and synthetic sable hair brushes, it's very good, they're very scientific. They do a very good job. And then some people's technology that go into making their brushes, they just do something, you know. <laughs> they just, okay, <laughs> this looks good. And they make the brush and they get on down the trail and that's it. And they make a sucky brush. So uh, I think it's very important to, uh, it's hard, you know, because I know that the people making artist materials there's only so many artists and a lot of times a person buy a pack of paint that comes with some cheap brushes already in them 
So people who make high-end brushes are really in a very, very tight, competitive niche market. But there's a lot of people that can make brushes because, let's face it, the technology to make brushes is fairly easy. You know, I mean, it's a certain type of machine that's going to... The most important part in a brush is this metal part here that attaches to the wood. And then the rest of it is the, the how hard is the wood, what type of material, or is it some type of plastic? And how good is that connection between the metal that holds the fibers in place and the wood handle? And then how many coats of paint? Is it an enamel coat of paint? I mean, when you go to clean these, is, can you easily clean the paint off the brush and get the, 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 the oil paint off the brush and keep the enamel paint on the brush, you know? These are very, uh, <clears throat> these are very important things to consider when you're getting a brush because a lot of times it's not so much how good the brush paints, but how good does the brush clean up when you paint, you know? Does it clean good or does it clean badly, you know? You know, and some brushes just clean badly. They just, they just don't clean well because the paint on them basically absorbs the, the, the oil paint. I like to paint oil. Same thing with acrylic. It will absorb the paint. So here you are trying to, um, you know, you're trying to put down a very, uh, you're trying to put down a very specific, uh, uh, you put down a certain color and then that color is soaking into the handle of the brush. And then when you go to clean it, it starts feeling tactile like the, Instead of you putting the, the, the paint on the canvas, you're putting the paint on your brushes that you just made an investment in. And what's happening is um, uh, that, that, that paint is not coming out that brush. It becomes, it bonds with the actual paint that the manufacturer used. And it starts to be annoying because you keep rubbing and rubbing and it's, of course, you, uh, you, when paint is not totally dry, especially with oil paint, it just keeps one to slowly come. You just never get the brush clean. So you're already tired at the end of a paint session because painting requires energy. I mean, there's some energy you got to use when you paint. I mean, that's just, I know I'm sitting here, it looks like I'm not you're using that much energy. Um, but man, at the end of the day, man, I'd be burning, I burn some calories, man. I could, <laughs> I can go eat a lot of calories after, after a painting session because it does require uh, some energy. You are putting out energy. And people don't understand what, at the end of the day, if you're going to spend four, five, six hours painting, your brain is going like a thousand miles an hour as a painter. And you don't even have to be moving that much, but you're burning a lot. <laughs> your brain wants to have calories when you're doing a lot of, you know, when you take a test or something like that, the last thing you want to do is be super hungry because you're going to answer questions in a bad way. You're going to go, oh, I knew that answer, but if I just kind of settled down some, I could have gotten it, you know? You don't want to go into a test hungry because a lot of times when you do, you don't answer the questions right. So uh, painting a painting is kind of like um, going to take a test, you know, if you were in school. It's kind of like... Um, you want to have your, your best thinking cap on. You want to have your A game working before you go into a paint session. You know, if you're just sitting around the house talking to friends and, you know, you got some guests come over, you've been watching TV, you've been surfing the internet, you're not really. You're thinking, but that ain't no big deal. You don't have to eat anything. You could just kind of be chilling. But when you know, okay, it's time for me to get ready to go paint, then all of a sudden your belly starts to feel hungry and you're like, hold on now, I got to go get something to eat. Uh, because you, your, your body is anticipating, you know, once before I did this painting session and I was super hungry in about hour two, I was, you know, just think about it. You go on a track and you're running, you're not using that much energy. You know, you're jogging, you know, you're going to run, say you're going to run five miles, you know, the first mile you might come out there with a little pep in your step, but if you know you're going to run five miles, you kind of pace yourself from first, you're not going to give all of your energy out. Some, but not all. You're not going to give all your energy out. And so you want to conserve your energy. So 
Those little steps you're taking, dude, you're not running a sprint. You cannot run a sprint. You cannot run a sprint for, for four or five hours straight. You just can't. So what am I saying? I'm saying painting is kind of like, it's not a sprint, but it's not a jog either. It's more or less somewhere in the middle, <laughs> you know, and in terms of your intellectual power, you know, it's somewhere in the middle of that. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to be um, going into it with a calorie deficit. And I used to, uh, you know, I used to do this thing. Cause I used to, you know, you know, practice for whatever purposes, fasting. I was wondering, I said, okay, as an artist, how come I don't really like to fast much? I mean, because I did it, you know, I was very faithful to it. And I was good at fasting, you know. I could fast for many days. I mean, I'm talking solemn, no water, no food, nothing. I mean, I did that stuff, you know. I was serious about it. And, uh, but I noticed that when I would do that, I just couldn't, my creative powers would kind of diminish a little bit. It would just, I didn't feel like doing that. I could do it, but I would look at, you know, I could feel my body. I said, gracious, it feels like I'm just getting thin. <laughs> you know, my body is, is, is metastasized, is kind of using some of the energy, is using the fat that I have on my body for brain energy. I could just feel it. So even though I might have been drawing a painting, but I'm fasting at the same time, there's a huge amount of um, energy coming out of my body. And so as a person, when you're not fasting, what you have a tendency, you kind of start realizing that, you know, especially you do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of painting like I do, you're doing a ton of painting. So you realize very quickly, you know, I feel hungry right now. Why do I feel like I need to go? And you don't want to be working in oil paint. Then all of a sudden feel like you need to go get a bunch of uh, Pringles, Batangles, potato chips or some, something like that. Something that's going to really feed the, uh, feed the, uh, the calorie monster in you, you know? <laughs> One of those kind of foods, you know? You don't want to do that, but um, because then you might be mixing the oil paint you know, with the, whatever you gobbling on, you know, whatever, whatever junk food you're trying to, because most of the time when you're eating that stuff, you're gobbling, you're not eating, you know, you turn into a little gobbling because your body is saying, feed me calories, you're starving me, and whatever activity you're doing, I need calories for. So, um, what has a tendency to happen is, um, what has a tendency to happen is, um, at least for me, what has a tendency to happen is all of a sudden I just go somewhere and just need to uh, absorb calories. I need to uh, eat something. Now, I am disciplined because I've been doing this for a while. And I've been painting anyway for a while. And I've learned to, you know, okay, I just got to get through this paint session. I'm not going to let nothing stop me uh, because I need to get... I want to get this done by a certain day. I mean, because if you don't do that, what's going to happen is you're never going to get your painting finished. <laughs> you know, life is just going to come in and say, okay, I got other plans, <laughs> you know, and then you're going to have all these half finished paintings. And then what's going to happen is you might not even want to do the painting anymore. You might say, okay, I'm tired of this painting. I mean, the, the moment for this painting was then I don't feel that moment anymore. I don't even want to look at this painting anymore. So. A lot of times you paint it while it's hot, you know? I mean, there's certain styles, like that Africa style that I was going through. I used to always paint in that style, and uh, now very rarely paint in that style. The reason why is that it was a period I was going through where I just loved to paint in that particular style. I mean, that was just, I was gonna always go to that. You couldn't convince me of anything else, and it just was something that was in my system. And as long as that was in my system, that's exactly how I was gonna paint. And I wasn't going to paint that much different. That's just how it was going to be. And uh, and then you kind of get, once you get enough paintings done, you know, like I guess Picasso was in his blue period, you know. Once you do a, a few paintings like that, and you go, okay, well, I've uh, expressed, I said everything I need to say about that visually. You know, I, I kind of, um, you know, because you are, you mean, it's visual, but you're speaking. You're speaking, you know? 
Um, like I say, I felt it was my duty to paint about the Tosinica mochas, you know? And so, and since I do work figuratively, and you know, and a lot of times you paint stuff, you say, well, I know this is gonna be provocative. This, this gonna, people gonna say, why, not? where is he painting that? <laughs> you know? And I know that, but it's like something deep inside of you says, do not care what nobody else think. Just paint this. And it's almost like just as sure as the sun coming up, and the clouds go from one side of the sky to the next. You ain't gonna stop it, you ain't gonna change it. That's just the way it is, you know? And um, so that's what happens, you know? You, you get that way, and you just gotta express that painting, you know? You have to express that painting for that moment. You have to, you know, you have to get into that. So that's a certain piece of energy that you get into. That's a certain way you get. <clears throat> And um, as an artist, at least that's how it is for me. It's a certain way. And uh, when I'm going through you, when I'm going through that period, I mean, you could tell me anything. I don't care. I just I'll go in one ear and go right out the other ear. I already know that this paint, this got to get creatively. This has to get done. I don't care if uh, uh, you know, I don't care what happens around me. Really. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else think. You know, if they're riding outside my door, if there's a war going, I don't care. I'm gonna paint these paintings this way. I don't care if somebody is just really gonna object to it. And they're gonna be really hurt by it. I don't care. You know, I have to express this. This is what's coming to me. The universe is bringing me these paintings. That's where I feel like I feel like the universe is making me do this. I'm compelled, and the the universe is ambiguous. It's not it, it's not a a it doesn't prescribe to a certain uh, philosophy. You know, it doesn't care about um, what's popular or not. And a lot of artists, we're you know, like the, for example, when I came up with that row on the throne was way before the coronavirus came up. You know, that design came way back in October 2019. August 2019, when I first got the concept, but I started working on it in earnest in October, early October. And um, I finished the design in late October, and then I actually started painting it. I didn't get around to painting it until April, right at the exact same time, coronavirus started getting real popular. And of course, Ra is sitting there on the throne over there, and he's contemplating what he's going to do with the earth. And um, there's hourglass there, and there's a wine goblet. Way before all these riots and all of the crazy stuff start, I mean, we already had wars going on. I mean, places like Libya and Syria had already run its course. Yemen, places like that. People doing, not treating each other, their fellow man too well. And of course, the powers that be, that preside over that, what are they thinking about this? Are there any powers to be in the first place? You know, or are we the powers that be, you know? So that's what this, the painting is addressing. It's, it's for us. It's not for, you know, the so-called gods or some pie-in-the-sky creature that I have there. It's not for that. The painting is the process, for us to process what we're going through. Could this be, you know, so in a sense, our art is prophetic. And it's true prophet, prophetic because it's a document. It exists. It's a picture. Picture is a, it's an artifact. Artifact is a document. It's an item that exists in the 3D world. It's a universal expression because you don't have to speak English. I mean, a person could be in Bangladesh right now, can't speak a word of English. They can look at this and know what's going on, you know? It could be a bird or a dog. They can look at this and know, oh, this is a guy with a hatchet. These are humans here. And he knows what's going on. So you speak in the same language. 
universal language of the universe. And so you get this universal image in your mind. And of course, you express it through painting. And you make the image. You just, the image comes out. My, the way I see art is the image comes out of my mind. The image is not something that you could take with a photograph. I mean, I don't know if you want to consider, I mean, I know they consider photography fine art too. I don't think so though. I mean, just, I'm prejudiced. I don't consider photography fine art. It's a craft, but it's not an art. To me, art is something that, um, that is, comes out of the mind, first of all. It does not come out of, out of a, a tool, like a camera. It doesn't come out of a lens. It, it's, it's not something that already exists in this world. It does not exist in this world. Uh, like for example, if you look at Michelangelo, uh, the hands of God. Nobody had a concept of God like that before. And it's, it's an idea too. So it's a thought, art is a thought. Now, can you make uh, a photograph a thought. Yes, you can. So now you just transform photography. So I just contradict myself. Now you just transform photography into art. See? But it's the way it's expressed that makes it art and not the technical craft. Because, you know, you get on the internet, you find a couple of internet classes, you get by a camera from whatever your favorite camera store is. You know, it's going to be a Canon or a Nikon or a Sony or something. All of a sudden, you're a photographer. I don't. I don't buy that. I just don't. I think uh, it's a journey. It's 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 the journey is inside of your head. I believe that that you're going to be expressing that journey other ways other than photography. Already, either through writing, through some music, some form of expression already. And uh, and what you need, what you do is you you what you found is this vehicle, by uh, which you can start um, getting those ideas more quicker to the surface. And then that's that's art. I mean, that now you're using photography as art. You know, um, however, when it's just a very technically well done photograph. I mean, well done, crafted, it looks beautiful. And uh, I think that's something that we can call art. It's definitely decorative, it's pretty, but art is not pretty. Art is not popular. And I go to guys like, Del artists like Delacroix. You know, he painted paintings that disturbed people in his day, that bothered them. The, 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 the ruling, the, the bourgeoisie didn't like him. <laughs> you know, the ruling class. Of, uh, he was always painting some underdog stuff, you know. Uh, now, there are certain artists that can just show you slices of your life. Oh, isn't that nice? A lot of people like artists like, um, uh, who's the guy? Um, uh, who's that very popular artist um, uh, Newman Newman Rockwell because he would paint little slices of people's lives he would just paint little moments that you thought of now to me that's still art because that's something that he need that need people need to be reminded of so something people need to see it, they've forgotten something you know so anything like that still it's still art now, you know? And so in that sense it's art. But just because you what I'm saying is not that uh, photography is an art. What I'm not I'm not saying that. I'm saying just because you pick up a camera don't mean that you're using it in such a way that you're really making, you know, fine art with it. You know, you're making some pretty pictures with it. But it might not really be fine art, you know. It, you might not really be saying anything other than this is a pretty picture. Or this is a picture that somebody would want to put in their living room, you know, <laughs> you know, on the shelf, you know. Uh, and I think if, if, if an average American suburban person would want to put your painting on their living room wall, 
I don't think you're saying anything because now you have a painting that it looks good, it matches their furniture. You know, I mean, now it could still be something that depends on the person. I mean, it could be a person who is very, you know, they 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 are into what the artist is trying to say, and they have they you don't mind putting some provocative work in their living room. You know, whether their guests may get upset or not. You know, maybe that's the kind of guest they always have, and they don't have anybody else come in. But I think art that makes that challenges people. You know, make people think that get people out of their comfort zone. To me, let's just not say it's not art. Let's just say, but to me, better art. It's better art. It's uh, it's interesting. It's something that um, that uh, you know, you can learn from something. You know, you can um. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's just, you know, so if there is a, uh, I guess you, I'm getting into a little bit of a weird place now because, um, I usually don't even try to tackle that topic at all, to tell you the truth. I usually don't, but for whatever reason, I find myself dropping into this topic today. Do I want to? Probably not. So why am I? I don't know. <laughs> However, that's what I'm doing. So uh, it is what it is. And um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead with this one. I'll do it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, but for me, I like to be able to bring ideas from my mind space. Uh, from from some other ultimate space, let's just say the ether space of thought. Then I like to bring these uh, images into the 3D world that we live in here. You know, and then they exist as they are. Now, uh, sometimes some people's art don't make a statement in their life. For example, Van Gogh had a, a unique way of seeing the world through his art. But Van Gogh never sold one painting. <laughs> I think he only sold one in his lifetime. While he was alive, while he was breathing on the earth, he sold one painting, sold only one. He was not very popular. It wasn't until after Van Gogh died, that his work start being seen as genius is like, well, whose whose work is this? Has appeared on the scene. I mean, Van Gogh had hundreds of paintings, hundreds of paintings, and nobody his paintings never saw the light of day. Now, did they see the light of day? Yes, there was a small group of people who were big fans of Van Gogh. It was just his inner circle of people that really, that he had of just people who really, really loved his work. It wasn't like this big following. But then Van Gogh transformed the entire art world. But he did that after he died. I mean, nobody was painting with that heavy impasto, with that, that crazy style that he had. Then all of a sudden, people start seeing Van Gogh and now all of a sudden, everybody is imitating this work. Everybody's work is starting to look like Van Gogh. Now, so when you do that, now that's art. Because what, what you're doing is you got followers. You got after the fact followers, way after the fact followers. <laughs> See, and that's art right there. Okay, so uh, where was these after the fact followers before? Uh, doing something else. <laughs> they were doing the pretty little girls in the metal pictures. They were doing a little flower uh, in the middle of a vase picture. They were doing a cabin in the woods picture. They were doing a mountain scene pictures. <laughs> you know? In terms of your figurative painters, I mean, because that's pretty. You know, you go to, oh, I'm just struck by nature. That's good because that's your vision. That's what you should paint. However, um, I can go with a camera and I can photograph some mountains 
then I can go into Photoshop and I can make a painterly effect that looks a lot like what you toiled over with your camera. And I could do that in about 15, 20 minutes. So you have to be careful because what's going to happen is uh, long after your career is over, people are going to look at your work and say, oh man, that's just, I've seen that kind of stuff. We can do that in five minutes in Photoshop. That is not moving the art world like Van Gogh's work did. That's not uh, showing me a different way to look at the image like Van Gogh's work did. Or some other like Cubism like Picasso and Brock. Not really doing that. Well, what is this work doing? It's just popular for right now. It was popular. When Picasso and Brock was doing their thing, other people was painting very, very popular stuff. And those people, their work is not... Um, it's, 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 their work is important because it's old, but their work is nowhere near as important as Picasso and Brock's work. Not even close. Not even the nearest ballpark. So you have to think uh, as an artist in the long run. I mean, what's my long game? You know, I know what my short game is, but what is the long game? You know, um, is my art saying something that's going to transcend time? Or is this some, just some popular images of today? If it is popular images of today, why am I doing it? Why do I feel compelled to do it? Should I feel compelled to do it? Why am I compelled to do it? You know, these things you need to ask, you know, like for now. Why am I compelled to paint the Seneca Mocha Native American? Well, the reason I'm compelled to do it is because their story needs to be told. And their story is on the verge of being forgotten forever and ever. Amen. Unless I step in and do something about it. But if I don't step in, their story will be forgotten for sure. It'll be forgotten almost forever. Now there'll be some some historians that would have that, that that have done the archaeology and tell what the truthful story is. But we have stories today that we believe to be true. That's not true. And then we have real history that happened during the time that we don't believe. <laughs> but we believe the the false tale to be absolutely one hundred percent true. So. I think we have a responsibility to mankind to uh, to uh, to communicate the proper stories. You know, communicate the proper things that's going to be better in the long run for mankind. You know, in terms of honest, it's going to allow. Uh, others in the future to have an opportunity to see another perspective that, that would never have gotten a chance to get seen. So this is what these paintings do. These paintings that I'm making now are not for today's time. A person in today's time is not going to understand what, when, and where, and how about these particular paintings here that I'm doing. They're going to see him as a little bit off, a little bit of propaganda, perhaps. A little bit, well, this guy's painting about some weird stuff that nobody else is really into much. But then again, it's always a certain group that is into this. And that group is generally a group that's usually underrepresented. It's a fringe group. At least a lot of things start out that way. I mean, the Christian religion started out as a fringe group of people. Look at it today. It is now the popular group. It is now the empowered group. It's actually the group that's infringing its uh, monolithic uh, beliefs on others. Whether those beliefs are for the better or the worse, it is in position to do that. I mean, so, uh, I mean, we see it all over the place. So, 
I mean, what are we going to do? I mean, what, what is going to happen, you know? So I think what's going to happen, as far as I'm concerned, I can actually do something. I'm an artist, so I'm a, I'm a person who does something. An artist is a person who does something, you know? He's going to dance. He's going to sing. He's going to paint. He's going to express He's going to do something. And that thing is going to be provocative. That's that's a definition of an artist, to provoke. Whether that artist provoke in a good way. Most artists, especially singers and dancers, they provoke in a good way. But then you have these other kind of artists, like, for example, rock and roll and acid rock. They kind of have a little bit of a negative uh, you know, look. You know, certain people say, oh, those rock and roll guys are this and that. They kind of have a negative uh, connotation to them. But then all of a sudden they become mainstream. <laughs> when they first come out, I remember when rock and roll, I remember seeing some documentaries, people were saying, oh, it's devil worship. It's the, wor it's, it's the music of Negroes, you know? You know, everybody was listening to Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra, certain, certain people like that, and symphony music, and uh, and not what you call rock and roll. And then now, all of a sudden, people would never listen to anything else. It's amazing. So without those artists taking those leaps then on something that was considered very unpopular, society would not have what it has today. And of course, one art form builds on the other one. In other words, you have certain other art forms that people say, oh, I'm not even really into that one. But you wouldn't even have your particular form of expression if it wasn't other people who was expressing their art form a different way, and you borrowed from them. So, you know, nobody is an island. Nobody creates all by themselves. Everybody borrows from the next, from the next person. Artists are no exception to that. However, the expression comes from you. Now, the expression is still yours. The expression is still your expression. I mean, this particular painting is still mine. The only person that could have thought of this painting is me. I mean, I'm the one who thought of this painting. Who else would think of it? Nope, just me. I'm the only one that probably would, <laughs> you know. Uh, would anybody want to? Probably not. They're not me, first of all, and they don't have the same experience in life as I do. But I am a human being on Earth experiencing life, and so certain things make an impression on me, and I'm the type of person who gets a feeling. I get an impression. I'm sensitive. You know, there are groups of people called empaths, and they tend to feel things a little bit deeper than the average person feels things. They actually can feel what other people feel. They can put themselves in somebody else's position and actually almost be that person for that time, for that place in time. And um, it's real, you know, it's very real for them. Whatever is happening is very real. It's not something that they're imagining. And to a certain level, for some people, myself included, I might be in kind of like a little bit of that ballpark. Whereas I get an idea and I'm kind of like an empath with it. I feel it and I feel like, okay, I really need to fix this. I need to relieve this. This is not right. Whatever's happening is not right. And the only way I can fix it is through expressing it this way. I mean, it's not the only way, but it's just the way that I choose to deal with it. And uh, that's kind of my philosophy on how I go about my art. That's a philosophy on how I go about it. I, um, I choose to express something that I've seen or experienced or learned about or read about or just came through, came to me in a vision, however it came to me. And then what I do is um, I proceed to get those ideas out of my mind 
into the 3D world and share it amongst other human beings. Now, what's going to happen is not all those human beings are going to like it. <laughs> not all those human beings are going to understand it. And they're going to have their own feelings about it. But that's good. That's good. I'm not going to say necessarily that's what I want to do. I Oh, that's good. a sign of good art because I'm doing that. No, that could just be ticking people off. <laughs> but it is something that needs to be expressed because that's what's given to you to express. So you just have to take those lumps and just know that that just comes with the turf. You know, this part comes with it. You, know, you might not be able to get around on that. And you might have to, you might have to risk that. You, know? you might have to risk that. And if you're not willing to risk that, uh, you may never make that art. You may never feel compelled enough, you know, because it does, again, take a, a little bit of work to get these things made. You know? It takes, uh, you got to make the time, you got to make the energy, you might have to spend a little bit of your money to make artwork. I mean, then uh, if you're going to do it professionally, you got to spend some money, you want to. You want to learn properly. You want to spend a little money learning, so you can uh, you can know everything you need to know, so that when you do hit people professionally, you have, you know, your your input into the thing is proper, strong, so that people can take your work serious because you do want to give your work a chance. You don't want to be the weakness to your work. You know, you want to have some kind of. Um, intelligence about yourself because uh, if you're not intelligent about art, in other words, if you don't know art history and you don't know, um, you know, as many techniques as you probably should know and people might say, well, why did you choose this technique? You could have done this, you could have used this. And then you could show people, look, I can, I can paint that way, but I chose to paint it this way. See, look at that piece of work that I've done over there. See that piece of work? I painted it that way. So I have the technical ability. I'm, I'm learning in that area. I'm educated in that area as an artist, as a person, a craftsperson. My skill sets, I do have those skill sets to paint in this way because I do take this serious. And however, I choose to work this other way and that kind of you're validated better when you can when you're educated properly like that when your skills are on point and you can go in any direction that you that you would you know uh, you know you kind of self-validate you know and the way you do that is uh, you get your make sure you get the proper education in art I think that's very important. A lot of people say, well, you don't need to go to school to be an artist. I would argue with that. I would say that's not true. I think, I think uh, if you want to be, just to make some pictures, no, you don't need to go to school. Just make your pictures. Teach yourself. A lot of artists do that anyway. However, if you wish to make uh, a large body work and actually make it in an industry. This is a business, it's an industry. It's a profession. So if you want to use, just like any profession, you can, you're gonna make cars, you better learn a lot about car making. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna make uh, windows for people's homes, and sell them in the window industry, you're gonna wanna know a lot. You wanna educate yourself. And most of the time, if you're gonna be hired as an engineer, for a company, not just say you make windows, you know, they're gonna want a professional. <laughs> they're not gonna want some dude that's self-taught. And say, okay, do we have the best window designer engineer that we can hire? So the same thing in painting is like um just because it's painting, you don't wanna um you don't wanna you don't wanna just if you go into it with an idea that painting is something that Anybody, you know, that you could just go in and take like, you're not going to have an industry. You're going to have something where you're going to charge people $100, $200 for your painting, and you can get on down the trail. But 
<laughs> and, you know, looking at it from a business point of view, well, let's not even look at it from a business point of view, let's look at it from a livelihood point of view. Um, if you, how many paintings can you make in a year and with a with hundred dollars that you're charging for your painting? You know, in other words, it might cost you fifty dollars to make the painting. That's assuming that it's gonna be a hundred dollar painting. You're only gonna put fifty dollars in your material, so you ain't giving nobody but fifty dollars worth of value in the first place. So now you're only giving fifty dollars worth of value, but it costs fifty dollars to make it. And you're going to sell it for 100 because it costs 50 to make it. Because if it costs 100 to make it and you sell it for 100, you ain't making no money. And now you got to buy, you got to keep your electric on so you can see the canvas. You got to have a building, you got to have a, a chair to sit on, you got to buy your paints, you got to buy, you got to buy the canvas, you got to buy whatever you're working with, linen, canvas, whatever. You're going to be, you're not going to be able to keep doing this. You know, you're not going to be able to keep doing it. You're going to run aground. You're going to be brought to a stop. <laughs> and it's going to be a self-inflicted wound, you know? Because you didn't think of it as a business. You didn't think of it as a profession. You thought of it as a hobby. Now, if you're doing it as a hobby, that's a whole different story because, in other words, you're retired. You're getting your pension money in there. And you don't need to worry about making any kind of profit. You just want to paint because you like it. And so that's what you're doing. So that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing. So now you can probably paint for the rest of your life because you're retired. And you have another way to support yourself. And you just don't need, you just don't need uh, to support yourself with your art. So you can afford to, um, you, know, you can afford to, uh, you know, you can afford to, um, <clears throat> I mean, you can afford to just make your art kind of in a vacuum somewhere, you know. And uh, however, if you're a younger person and you're you're single, you live alone, or so you're not single, you're married, even worse, you got kids. And you need some income. Uh, you're gonna have to make your art support itself. So you're not gonna be able to sell your work for $100 per painting. Unless you can make one painting a day, but you also have to be able to sell one painting a day. If that's the case, if you could make one painting a day, you can make 365 paintings and then you sell it each for $100 and you can make yourself $36,000 a year. You can do that. You're not making a lot of money, but you're doing all, you might be able to get yourself some bread and something to eat, you know. A little house, you know, a small house to live in and paint, you know. But if you really want to make anything that, you know, is going to really get you going and cause you to grow in art, better you can thrive and survive you're gonna to want to probably make something like even if you're just doing cheap work you want about 200 because now you want to make about 70,000 okay now you can do pretty good because you're making about $70,000 a year $200 profit so say if it costs you $50 you're putting a little bit more into it so now it costs you $75 and then so you your pain is gonna be about $275 and that's just if you're just a super good salesman or just your subject matter is so intense that everybody wants to buy it and you have you're able to make a paint every day and every single painting sells <laughs> then you could do that but in reality most artists don't work that way most artists what's going to happen to them with them is uh, What's going to happen with them is the painting is going to go a week. They're going to make 50 paintings a year. And then they're going to want about $1,000, $2,000 profit, you know, to make 50 to to $100,000 because they're not going to sell all of them. 
only going to sell half of them. So if they sell half of $50,000 worth of potential profit, they're going to make $25,000. If they do, and if they sell them and they're getting $100,000, they sell half of those, they're going to get uh, $50,000. You know? So you have to think of it like that. So now you're in a business where you have to start thinking about stuff like that. You're in a situation where you want to have some credentials to help you to get the amount, be, be worthy to get the amount of money you think that you should be getting. You don't want to be in a position to not get the type of money that you think you should get because, um, you know, you just don't want to be in that position. Okay, so um, now I was able to deal with this guy down here. So he doesn't look so wispily painted like he did. Actually, to tell you the truth, the gestural version of him, I rather liked. Um, this version is still somewhat gestural, but this is good enough to be my underpainting version of him because I'm going to obscure him quite a bit. But I want him painted a certain way as my underpainting that's going to be through this grass. Now what I'm doing is going in with a little sable brush, a little small, and just doing a little blending here and there. Uh, of some of the brush strokes, trying to put in some nicer brush strokes than I have already. In some places, I like to leave the brush strokes there because I like the way they are. In other places, I want to go back over them a little bit, maybe do a little bit more blending or just move the brush strokes in a different way than the original way I put them on. Because what's going to happen is this paint is going to set up this way. And by tomorrow, I should be able to paint over this. So what I want is I want a nice set of paint here that I can paint over. And if I have a little piece of something poking through, I won't see it as like a bad piece of paint. It will actually look like some really good paintings under there. You know, some painting that I could be happy about if it's still revealed. <clears throat> you know, in terms of the way the brush strokes look, you know, and etc. And the way the paint looks and the way the modeling looks on it. <clears throat> So I'm just, just wiping this brush and just blending what's already on the canvas. It's kind of going through just looking real close at the canvas. Just dapping here and there, brushing here and there. I'm just trying to smooth out some tones that I might feel like need to be smooth. Sometimes you smooth stuff and you shouldn't. <laughs> And sometimes you don't smooth stuff that you should smooth. So, again, you know, sometimes what one good thing about it is you smooth something out, you go back and get some more paint, paint over that, or let that set up, come back another day, do something different, paint right over top of it with something else. <clears throat> you know? However, I rather like it. <clears throat> I like it just like that. So now I have a guy who's already bit the bullet. And now what I'm going to do is, and he's kind of in the shadow, so I already painted him with a little bit of caroscura. You know, where he kind of fades the black, sort of. And uh, he doesn't, this black is not all black. You can see me painting the colors of black now. It has some subtleties to it now. On your camera, it probably looks all black. And it is. In some areas, it's very dense black. But what I wish I had was a real big mop brush, which I don't. <clears throat> but I do have this pretty big number 14 filber bristle brush. I'm just going to go around and just add a little interesting brush strokes. 
here and there. And this is when I use the long handle of the long handle brushes. Because I do like long handle brushes. And I like them because I can back up, get my head in different positions according to the lighting in my studio. And I can look at my brush strokes. Get a feel for them. You know, at a distance. You know, because a lot of times you're painting, your head's within 24 inches or closer to the canvas. And you really don't get the best vantage point on your brush strokes or things. And so um, having the long handles allows you to do less backing up like I do where I back way over and I see something and I go back in. I can generally tackle certain things right here as I paint. Just trying to make, even though this is going to be covered, I still want a nice patina on that field of paint right there. I want that nice. Okay, so now, and I like my whole canvas covered. I don't like any gesso white. That's basically what I have now. I had some little scumbling over there, and I've dealt with that. So I don't even have that anymore. And I might have some little creases here and there, but for the most part, Everything is addressed. So now I'm going to come back and look again. I'm going to get my mock-up drawn. And I'm also going to get some water. And I'm going to take a look. Oh, I forgot to test my um, audio real quick. Let me just do that. Because once I did something where I was talking, nobody could hear me. But I think I got everything plugged in right today. So I think everybody should be able to hear me loud and clear. So let me get myself in like I should be in here. Oh, here I am. Let me get myself in like I should be in here. Okay, so I think I got it. There we go. So I got good sound. So I sound pretty good. Coming in nice and clear, so that's good. All right, so um, okay, what I'm looking for now, I need to get back and meditate for a smidge. That's what I'm going to do. Let's right, see. Let me read the room, see if I have some new comments, some good comments. No. Not any. Okay, so that's it's all good. <clears throat> okay, so um, just doing a little meditation here in terms of what I'm going to paint next on here. And um, and even though I had it kind of skimmed in, it's that black really makes that solid. I mean that that corner has gotten really strong all of a sudden. It's the last time I sat back and looked at it, which is quite nice. So I like that. I like that a lot. And uh, also, it also has brought that forward in the space more. Separated it from the, so that becomes the, the, the very most foreground. That becomes the very foremost foreground, so. <laughs> That's nice. I want that. I might even have some grass, even more in the foreground there, to give me even more foreground. So I have multiple levels of grounds in this painting. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six different levels. If you include the sky, seven. <laughs> and that's how I like it, you know. Might even put a little falcon or bird or something or eagle or something way in the in the sky somewhere back there. Don't know yet. Just as at the end, you know, just really tiny flying through the sky. Just as a little finishing touch. I might do that. Just thought of that right now. So, all right. So what is next? What next? It now I am. So now I've dealt with that. I, I still have some other issues where certain images really need to pop away 
certain images need really need to come out. Now I could work on Juan Squahan Sinoka more to make him come forward more. I think I should. Uh, Cause I really need him to separate. I mean, he's already separated quite nice, but I think I want him to separate some more. So, and this is differing from my mock-up drawing, but uh, sometimes you want them to kind of come out of the darkness. Then sometimes we don't. Sometimes we need to experiment a little bit. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Like I say, uh, it's one thing to have a mock-up. The mock-up or reference gets you started. But once you get started, um, the image starts telling you that you're creating starts telling you what to do. It starts telling you, um, you know, how you should do something, you know. And so what I'm doing is I'm being sensitive to that. So I'm going to go in with this little round brush. I believe this is a synthetic. Uh, and it feels sort of like a sable brush. But it also feels a little stronger than a sable brush, like it's also a, um, a bristle. But it's a synthetic. And it kind of makes a really nice little line like that one I was just able to pop in there on that. Now, that little hairline kind of makes it look sort of like a cutout a little bit. And I don't really want it to look like that. So what I'm going to do with that line is I'm going to go in with another brush. And I'm going to get a little bit of um, cadmium yellow, medium, a little bit of yellow ochre. and then a little bit of burnt sienna, and then a little bit of raw umber. And I'm gonna mix this kind of like tan brown together with these colors. And it might be just a smidge of titanium white in there too to just kind of lighten it up. And it's kind of like a medium color. And what I'm gonna do is come in with this other brush that is also a synthetic sable. I'm just gonna kinda cut that little thin line that I just made in half with a dark, slightly darker color. And then here's a color that I painted the other day. I'm gonna do the same thing with it just to kinda minimize it somewhat. <clears throat> and what that's gonna do is gonna help me make that shape come forward without it necessarily looking like a cutout. Okay, what I'm gonna also do with that is now I'm gonna start taking the other color, the lighter color that I had, and I'm gonna bring it more into the middle tone this morning. To kind of give me like, uh, you know, like it's some sun is coming off of him. I'm trying to follow some of the anatomy with this bring these tones in some. We'll go back to the other brush with that little mocha color that I just mixed up with um, raw umber, burnt sienna, and so on. So what I'm doing is just taking just a little edge of that with this darker color, and I'm blending that into the existing uh, tones here. Just to create a little light edge, you know, just a little light edge on his on that side of his torso, just to add a little bit more separation on that background there. So I do want some separation there. I don't want it to necessarily go into that because he's a main character here. He's Wahan Sanoka. And I want him emphasized. I want him to be looked at. I don't want him to be uh, minimized because he's communicating. You can see what he's communicating there. 
and uh, his body gestures, the language of his body is important. Uh, the language of what he's doing is important. Okay, now I'm going to take the same brush and just mix a little bit more yellow and raw umber into it. And just try to smooth it out some with the other tones. <laughs> 